I've been asked to share uh, about a uh, passage from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11 on, uh, on communion. This, but this isn't communion Sunday, right? The first uh, next, week. next Yeah, so maybe it's to prepare. Because we, we, uh, we take communion monthly, and you know, the, 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 the challenge is we don't want to go through the motions. We want to know what it means. And uh, at my church, we go up as a family, actually, and we take communion as a family. And I really like that because then we, we pray together and really uh, remember that, what it means. So uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, uh, verse, and I'm going to read actually from 17 through 26 from the ESV because that's the, uh, the, whole, the whole context. But uh, we're going to zero in on uh, verse 26 of so 1 Corinthians. Uh, Chapter 11, starting with verse 17. Um, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I receive from the Lord what I deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink it, this bread and eat, and eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's day, death, until he comes. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray this morning that we'll be able to learn from your word and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So this... Uh, passage is familiar, uh, the, the last part, it is important when we look at scripture to look at the context. So when I am given a passage to preach on, I am interested in what comes before and what comes after. And actually this passage, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, is a really interesting passage. It's instructions to the church at Corinth, but it applies, I think, uh, uh, definitely applies to all of us. And so you can see from the first part of what I read, that there are factions. Factions are divisions within the church and divisions. And how does that, how is that addressed? So one way it's addressed is to remember Jesus, to take communion, to come to the Lord's table. So Paul is bringing up that solution in response to the challenges and the factions and the divisions at the church of Corinth. So that's part of the context. Another very interesting part of the context is even before uh, I won't read this whole passage, but if you go back to the beginning of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, and remember in biblical times there were no chapters or divisions, it was a letter. And so uh, the modern writers and editors have put in chapters and verses and all that, but we can think of it as a whole letter, which makes it even more important to consider the context. So if you look at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter, uh, chapter 11, the beginning, it's about head coverings. And that's something we never hear about in the modern church. But if it's in the Bible, it's important. It's God's word, and we need to understand it. And so, uh, and for the head coverings, which let's we'll start there because that's that's ultimately a part of the context as well. Um, I'll just read some some highlights of the whole passage. So, First Corinthians, uh, chapter eleven, uh, Paul writes, uh, starting with the verse three. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head covered dishonors her head, since the same as if her head were shaven. But if a lot of, and then it, let's, let's skip down. So there we go, down to 13. Judge for yourself 
Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does it not nature itself, does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is for her glory, for her hair cover, cover her hair is given to her for covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice for the churches. So again, it's addressing this idea of division. But this, you know, some, uh, so this morning as I was headed out the door, my wife said, your hair is, is long, but you're going to get a cut. And, uh, but, but I could have said, uh, uh, and pointed to the scripture that, um, you know, God addresses uh, long. She could have said, if your hair is long, you're disgracing God. It says it right here, right? If a, if a man wears long hair, it's a disgrace for him. So, you know, that, so that, that's why the context is important. And, and uh, every so often, uh, usually about once a month, I go and I worship at an Indian Christian church in Alhambra. I think many of you know I've shared, I've shared that I have a real heart for uh, Indians. And so I'm learning to speak lang the language, and I go to the church to worship. So the language is in Gujarati, but the culture is different. And so uh, when a woman goes up to deliver, uh, to read scripture, She's wearing, her head is covered. It's, it, and it's, it's kind of a lace uh, veil that covers her head. It's not like a Muslim uh, veil. It's, her head is covered, or her, her hair is covered with a veil. Um, and then when women, sometimes there's a women's choir that, that sings. The women who are married have their head covered. And you say, well, that's, you know, that's interesting because we're not used to that in our churches. But when you look at history, throughout history, um, because of this passage, most, for a long time, all women covered their head, all married women at, at, at church. And even today, there are, there are uh, sects, S-E-C-T-S, of, of Protestant, Bible-believing Christians who cover their head. Have you heard of the Amish in, in Philadelphia, the Pennsylvania area? So there are denominations of Christianity where women cover their head all the time. Not just a church, uh, Orthodox uh, uh, Christians. So you hear in the news about in Egypt, Coptic Christians uh, have been blown up by terrorists. It's a very recent situation. But if you look at the pictures, the women usually have a veil over their head when they're when they're at the church. Um, how about a, how about a nun? And not, nuns are fully veiled in most 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 orders. And you say, well, is that? Um, What's the difference between a nun covering her, covering her with a veil and a Muslim? So that's, so that's very interesting to think about. But remember the context of this passage is that women are to do that, it says, because it, the, if you go back to being the head of every man's Christ, the head of the wife is her husband. And so these, it's, a, it's a way to show submission and honor to her husband, and ultimately it's interpreted, this passage, to show honor to God, to be submissive. And that's a word we don't usually uh, highlight, because wives are supposed to be submissive to their husbands, but it's as Christ is the church. And so it's, it's in that context that women uh, are supposed to wear to cover their heads, according to the scripture. But, uh, and it's still an issue. If you if you saw the news recently, uh, President Trump traveled to Saudi Arabia first, and his wife, how do you pronounce her name, Meliana, Meliana. So she uh, she got off the plane in Saudi Arabia, and she wasn't wearing a veil, whereas some uh, visitors who are even non-Muslim will, uh, will show respect by wearing a veil. But she did, and, and the president was set. Uh, uh, Mrs. Obama didn't wear a veil when she was in Saudi Arabia. Hillary Clinton didn't wear a veil. And so, so she was, it, it was common and odd, but it was okay. But when she, the, the, where was his next stop? Actually, the next, next stop was at the Vatican to visit Pope Francis. Anybody read about this? When she visited Pope Francis, she was wearing a black veil. And so you say, well, well that's interesting. She didn't wear a veil. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, she wore a black veil, and it's, it's actually this is the it's because of this passage that she is showing respect, and it, it's a tradition that basically all any visitor to the Vatican in the presence of the Pope uh, needs to wear this special kind of it's a lace veil, and it, and the amazing thing also it's black, 
which is a which is a color associated with death. Sometimes. But that's you say, why is she doing that? Well, that's the tradition that's passed down in the Catholic Church. Even the Queen of England uh, wore a black veil under her crown when she went and visited the Pope. But when the Pope visits her, then she doesn't have to wear a veil. So, uh, so that was just in the news. And so the reality is, when you look at is you know what uh, what the context is, uh, it's it's a way for women to show submission uh, to their husbands, submission to God, but it's not a requirement. So that's part of the grace of Scripture is there's freedom to do that or to not do that. And so that's the modern interpretation is we have freedom and it's but it's. It, uh, in the U.S., we saw. If you look at old movies of Christians in churches, the women are wearing a lot of times they're wearing, wearing hats, and that's the evolution of going from a veil to something more modern, which is a hat. And now most women don't wear anything on their heads. So that's the context of this passage. Very, you know, very interesting to consider. Uh, but I, I point out this passage a lot when I'm when I'm with. Uh, when people are critical of Muslims where women wearing veils. Now, it seems like it's for a different reason as well, but when you look at the, there is an influence of Christianity and Islam, and that's a way to show submission to God. So that's, you know, it's kind of interesting when you think about that, that one uh, case, but again, uh, most Christians in the world, even today, Christian women who are married will wear a veil when they worship. Uh, and the reason that Amish and Mennonite women uh, uh, wear a, uh, a veil all the time is they believe they could be worshiping God, they should be worshiping God 24-7, not just when they are in church. But most interpret that to say in church, when you're praying, uh, when you're reading scripture, you should wear a veil. So that's, uh, that's something that as I was studying over this passage, that kind of jumped out at me. This is a good chance to talk about it. And it's in the context of Holy Communion. And then when we, uh, when we set up communion, uh, when we look at this, um, it says, uh, when you come together as a church, there are divisions. And so, as I said, the way to deal with the divisions is to, uh, is to remember Jesus and to gather around the table uh, together. And so this, as you know, the story uh, is the, uh, the Passover feast uh, when Jewish people were coming to Jerusalem to celebrate uh, the Passover, the time when the angel of death passed over because there was blood of the lamb on the doorpost. And so the angel of death passed over. So Jewish people even today will celebrate that uh, to show that, that the sacrifice of the perfect lamb led to the safety and the, and the freedom uh, from sin and from death. And so that's the message of communion because the death of Jesus, the perfect sacrifice for our sins, is what we believe as, as Christians. And so that's why we celebrate the Lord's Supper. So Jesus, again, uh, uh, writes that it is the bread uh, I received from the Lord, which I also delivered to you, where Jesus on the night when he betrayed took the bread and we've given thanks, he broke it, said, this is my body, which is for you, so the bread, uh, but is it always bread? So my church, we use stale crackers. You know, so that's, that's another interesting cultural uh, remnant. When I go to the Indian church, you know what they use? They use rotli, which is, if you know naan, it's, it's basically Indian bread. Because bread is a Western thing, but it's, it, it has yeast in it. Uh, but even using yeast is an issue because in the, we know at the time of Passover they used unleavened bread to celebrate the Exodus. So even that is a, is a tricky thing. I have some Indian friends who actually use coconut, a little piece of coconut to celebrate. And so that's interesting too. So those are all different forms, but the key is to, is to establish what the meaning is. And so this, uh, Jesus said, this is my body. So this it represents the body. Now in the Catholic Church, maybe Christian has experience with this, actually that it's different, the, the belief is that the, the bread is actually the body of Jesus. And so that's, 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 a, that's another issue that is not, uh, not um, believed by Protestants. 
And so the, the, the Catholics believe that the, the bread is the actual body of Jesus and that the uh, wine or the juice is the actual blood of Jesus. So you have to make that substitution in your mind. But for Christians, uh, Protestant Christians, we believe that uh, it represents the body of Jesus. And when we, when we uh, and so when I pray with my family, we always pray, Jesus, thank you for reminding us, helping us remember that this is your body, just like this cracker is broken, the bread is broken. We remember how you suffered, how your body was broken as a payment for our sin, the sacrifice, the perfect. So, so it's a great. So I really like praying like that with my family because it reminds us and. Uh, of what the purpose is, and and this the passage, do this in remembrance of me. That's very explicit. You do this to remember the sacrifice of Jesus, and that's the gospel. That's the whole the whole key. And then he says, in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, "This cup is the new covenant, my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me." So the same thing, because Jesus fled, uh, then we remember that. He died on the cross, that he suffered for our sin, and so we remember that. Now, as I was reading this, another issue that comes up in, in modern traditions is wine or grape juice. So, if you go to an Episcopal church and you take communion, what do they give you? If you're over, what's the drinking age, 21? If you're over 21, you get a little, a little sip of red wine. And so you say, well, that's really weird because our church uses grape juice. But the reality is that's, uh, when you look at scripture, that's what was used. And so, uh, and so people say, well, was it really wine? And so you go back and you, you say, well, let's look at the context. Where was wine mentioned in, in, in scripture? And so very interestingly enough, the first miracle that Jesus did, anybody know what that was? Water Tur wine. Yeah, turning water into wine, the wedding at Cana. So you say, well, oh, that's interesting. Why would Jesus, is Jesus condoning uh, drinking alcoholic beverages? And so when we look at the wedding at Cana, uh, it's actually John chapter 2. So it's about as early as you can get. Uh, and so uh, if you look at the context, I'll just, I'll just read the highlights. Uh, the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. Other Jesus' so mom was there too, so it's like he was, he was, uh, was Jesus drinking wine in front of his mom. So you say, well, that's interesting. So this is John chapter two. Uh, so Jesus was invited. Another Jesus was there. Jesus was also invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine uh, ran out, um, the mother of Jesus said to him, "They have no wine." And Jesus said to her, "Woman, why does this have to do with me? Like, why are you bugging me?" Uh, my hour has not come. So the hour for him basically to do his ministry has not. So that's really early. Uh, his mother said to the servants, uh, do whatever he tells you. And then there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons of water. So that's a lot of wine. And he said to the servants, fill the jars with water. They filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. They took it and the master of the feast tasted the water now had become wine. They did not know where it came from, that it came from, that the servants knew who had, who had run the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, when people have drunk freely than the poor wine. You have kept the good wine. So what does that mean? It means it has a higher, maybe higher alcoholic content. Because bad wine, uh, I've heard, has low alcohol content. Um, and so he said, every, every, uh, you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana and Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed, his disciples believed in him. So you always say with, when you read a, a count of miracle, why did he do this? And especially it looked like he was kind of, he didn't plan this, right? His mom pressured him, he's a, he's, a good, he's a good son. His mom kind of pressured him into doing this. But uh, it turned out it was for God's purposes. So he said, uh, he did this, uh, manifested his glory, so revealed his glory, that he was the Son of God, uh, and it, it also was a testimony to his disciples. His disciples believed in him. It's, easier, it's easy to believe in someone. Uh, later, he's going to spend a lot of time raising people from the dead and healing people. But this was very different. 
and but it still served the same purpose. It was disciples. It was for his disciples. Remember, they were the key people. They were the twelve uh, that served within the ministry. So you say, well, uh, what is this about? Is Jesus? Did Jesus drink the wine? Did he? Did he? Was his goal to get everybody drunk? Because this, this is late in the you know, late in the the wedding, right? The, 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 the wine's already gone. And so, what does that mean? People maybe are a little bit, a little bit uh, inebriated, uh, to use a technical word. And so, when you look, so there's a lot of theories about this. So, one thing you always do when you check something like this, you say, if you you look at the Greek, uh, and so you say, what when when, they, when he was saying wine, uh, other other passages say sometimes the fruit of the vine, which is the same, which is basically the, the grapes. And so the question is, what is this? Is this real wine? But when you look at the Greek word, the word is oinos, O-I-N-O-S. Have you had Greek yet? So you say, so it's oinos, and that is wine. It's not grape juice. Um, the question, though, is what is the uh, uh, what is the alcoholic content of the wine? And we don't know that. Uh, but if it's good wine, you know, it, it's it's probably uh, has. <laughs> alcohol in it, uh, and so, um, and again, you know, when you when you look at something like this, it's important to look at the context, not to zero in on this story, but to say what are what are other examples in Scripture of wine and Jesus, you know, did Jesus talk about wine? And so I think that's again this, this idea of the context. So I've got some there's some passages here um, that are very interesting about. Uh, Alcohol. One, yeah, one that's very interesting is, is 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 5, uh, verse 23. Uh, so Paul's writing to Timothy about. So I really trust what Paul says. Uh, 1 Timothy 5, 23. Um, so Paul, and this is actually in parentheses. It's, uh, Paul writes to Timothy, "No longer drink only water, but use a little wine." For the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments, so that's not some, the passage that jumps out. But the the, the reality is that in uh, biblical times and even now in many countries, the water isn't safe to drink, right? It has bacteria in it, and it has a lot of it has a lot of uh, impurities. So when I go to India, I'll be in, I'll be in India in three weeks, and so can I drink the water there? No way. It's filled with bacteria. Many countries are like that. Although I was in China uh, last month, and almost every, the hotel we stayed in and the restaurants, the water is filtered now. So there's a filter, so it's actually uh, much, much better. Uh, but the reality is, so Christians in in uh, China uh, will drink beer because the water, you know, because you don't drink water because it makes you sick. And so many, uh, in, if you go to Europe, um, a, lot of, a lot of Christians will drink wine in low, low amounts, but because it's, it's safer than water. And it's actually, I probably shouldn't say this in church, but it, but it does, it, there's research that shows that a little bit of red wine you know, has health benefits. And when you look at this, for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments, it's, it's, it's in scripture. Now, the context, though, is, and we know many passages where it says, do not get drunk. And so they're, they're too numerous even to go over, but clearly there's a, there's a strong admonition to not get drunk, to not, because you lose control. God, you want God to be in control. So there are numerous passages about, uh, about not, I should probably do one just to make sure that you're not hearing just the, <laughs> the, 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 the uh, Okay, Acts 2.15, that's a good one. Is that right? No, that's talking about drunkenness. Oh, there we go. Ephesians, Ephesians 5.18. So numerous that I didn't write any down. <clears throat> Ephesians 5. Yeah, so here we go. And do not get drunk with wine. That's about as straightforward as you can get. <laughs> but that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So that's probably the best passage. So clearly, you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, 
and controlled by God and not controlled by wine, by alcohol. And so uh, what I, my personal theory is that the alcoholic content in wine during that time was pretty low. So you had to drink a lot to, to uh, experience drunkenness. Now, in this day and age, and I think I've seen statistics on this, the alcoholic content of, of wine, of beer, of many drinks is pretty high. And so it doesn't, so because that, the company wants you to get drunk and drink more. So I think that's part of it. So that the level of alcohol is much, much higher in modern alcoholic beverages. So please, I hope I, I, I'm surprised I'm talking about drinking so much in church, but <laughs> I apologize for that. But probably better me than, anyway, so, um, so that's, so clearly um, uh, when you look at, uh, partaking wine with communion, it's, it's okay in certain traditions, but it has to be in that context of, of not, uh, not getting drunk, not, not losing control, etc. But when we look at scripture, there is, and I heard this a lot from my, that's one of the big questions international students ask me is, because there's, a, there's a definitely a, 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 in our Protestant Western tradition, Alcohol is usually not uh, consumed uh, among among Christians, and so it, uh, and so that's an issue. It's, it's, it's important to address, and and so typically a non-Christian will say to me, "Hey, didn't Jesus drink wine? Didn't so they, sometimes they know this parable better than we do?" And so it's important to be able to understand uh, the context and what it all means. And again, getting back to the theme, the, the, the idea of, of holy communion. And so the, the, the meaning of drinking the grape juice or wine is the most important thing, not what we're actually drinking. So again, even some of my Indian Christian friends will say we can we can we can use coconut and coconut milk. Yeah. You know, so that's a little. You know, so that I think that crosses the line <laughs> because because it's not fruit of the vine. So, but you know that that's. If it has that meaning of the, of the blood of Jesus, uh, then that's, that's something that is uh, the most important thing. So I have seen Indian Christians take a coconut to say, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. So coconut has great significance in South Asia. Uh, anybody like coconuts? So you can actually buy them at the, at the Asian market. And, uh, and th actually throughout much of the world, uh, so you buy the coconut. and uh, you uh, read, read the passage, and the way to open a coconut is to take a hammer, and you hammer around the, the, uh, the uh, circumference, I use a math term, uh, you hammer around the circumference, and it eventually starts to crack. And anybody done this? Yes. So you can start to crack, and then you know what comes out of it? The white, uh, the white coconut milk. And then you open it, and the rest drains out. So it's kind of messy, but you have this broken coconut. And so, I, so Indian Christian actually, I know, uses that as a way to witness for the gospel. He says, this is the, in the same way that Jesus, he's, and he reads this passage, the, the passage of, on Good Friday, that Jesus suffered, boom, and the nails, boom, and he's, he's banging on this coconut. And, and, and so that has, you know, that's pretty powerful. Nails and the suffering in his in his bodies because it, it makes a pretty big sound when it's in, when it's indoors banging on this coconut and then and finally you know his, he like <coughs> gave up his life you know and, the, and then the blood and the blood though is not red what kind of blood is it pure white because Jesus was sinless so that has you know so that's a way to yeah so it's pretty cool but. I would say, still, I would I would encourage I would encourage uh, using the Indian bread and 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 wine or grape juice because that's uh, I think that's true to scripture. But the coconut's pretty cool, you know, as a way to communicate the gospel. But that's different. See, that's different from from the Lord's Supper. I would say when we when we look at the scripture and what the Greek says. And oh, the other funny thing about coconuts. So I think I shared this before. I, I probably shouldn't say this, but sometimes Hudson, because he's Asian but doesn't speak any Chinese, sometimes people call him what? Banana. 
No. <laughs> Sorry. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Indians, Indians, Pakistanis, who were, were born in the U.S. It, it's called the coconut generation. <laughs> so, and, and yeah, so, and, uh, and so many people call me an egg. <laughs> oh, outside. Yeah. 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 No, I'm so proud of that. Because I'm multicultural. Because I speak more, I speak more Chinese than my son. So, <laughs> anyway, so, but that's we got to get off track. Oh, that was about the coconut. <laughs> so, yeah. but that's yeah. So, and I've also seen uh, Indian Christians uh, use a banana and. Uh, and uh, co coconut milk to, to, for communion. So that's, yeah, yeah, so, so the question is, and the, really the big idea, what is the meaning? You know, are you, are you associating the body and the blood of Jesus with this, with this object? Is it helping you to remember Jesus? And so I would say, uh, you know, with, uh, bread is cultural. We say, you know, when we say, uh, <coughs> what is, what do we use in communion? And I grew up with actually with a loaf of bread. The pastor would stand up there and do it. You guys, see it? Yeah. So a loaf of bread, and you, and the pastor would get up and say this, and read the scripture and say, this is the body of Jesus broken, and he and he breaks it actually. So that's pretty cool. So a lot of churches now don't go through that. They just have a tray of stale crackers. So um, I said I shouldn't criticize stale crackers, but. Uh, and some churches uh, have a uh, little cube of bread, so uh, there's different ways to do it. But the key, when you look at the passage, is again when it says, "Do this in remembrance of me." And this part uh, is a different meaning for different people. If you did this in, if you use crackers in India, you know they would they would say, "What is this? You know, we don't, we don't, this is such a strange thing." Uh, but what is when you know what is bread? Uh, in certain cultures, there's no bread used even. You know, so what about Japan? What do, what do Japanese do for, for communion? And so the reality is that's an influence of the Western Church. They do use bread because the missionaries brought bread and said this is what we do. So I think that's okay if they if they if they uh, attach the meaning. But would it be wrong to use to use to use rice, like a rice ball. I mean, rice balls and just got these rice balls are pretty tasty. Is it, would that be? You know, so that's that's the interesting thing. So I think um, I think it's okay because it says uh, it says the bread and the and the, the cup, I meaning the cup of, of wine or grape juice, fruit of the vine. That is okay to attach that uh, uh, if in your mind you attach that meaning. This this is. This, or help me remember the, the, the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus, then that's the most important thing. And, the, and that's the beauty of Christianity, is it can fit into any culture. And so that's what we have to always remember, is the way that we do something is not the only way. And the question is, what is meaningful to us? And that's the thing I love about the Lord's Supper, is that it has should have great, great meaning. And we remember the sacrifice of Jesus, and that's that's the key message. Uh, but again, it's easy to get uh, distracted to uh, to get cut. So the church, over time, this issue of do you use wine or grape juice has divided churches, and so that brings us back to remember the context of this was the division within the church at Corinth. So again, the previous paragraph uh, in verse 20, Paul writes, "When you come together." It is not the Lord's Supper you're eating. Uh, for eating, each one goes ahead uh, with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. Oh, he's talking about drunk here. Uh, do you not have houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God and merely those who have nothing? Which they despise. So it's really talking about the idea that the Lord's Supper is not just for uh, remembering the death of Jesus, it's also a place of unity. And so it's very, and so when, uh, one of the traditions that, that has come down in many churches is the way we practice communion. So uh, the church I grew up in, which is a Presbyterian church, we'd sit in the, in the pew. Uh, there used to be these things called pews that were wooden and, and uh, 
uh, really uncomfortable. And, and, uh, and now we have comfortable chairs, but easier to fall asleep in, <laughs> or couches. Uh, but uh, but actually, that, that, so, but actually, in many traditions uh, for worshiping God, when you go to church, you actually sit on the floor. So when Jesus was was at the wedding, the guests would be sitting on the floor. The Lord's Supper, the, the paintings show the, dis, the disciples sitting around the table, but we know probably they were sitting on the floor because that's the way things were done at that time. When I eat with my Indian friends, what do I do? Sit on the floor. And, and when Paul's when Paul's preaching, people are sitting on the floor. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is sitting on a rock, probably on a, on a mountain, and people are <coughs> sitting. So he who was smart, actually, it's very. If you fall asleep on the, on the floor, you only fall asleep once because you bonk your head. <laughs> so um, where was I? Oh, the way you, so the way so uh, typically the tradition in communion, and I think at, at this church also that, that you pass the. Uh, you pass the bread down the aisle, and you take, is that how we do this? Yeah. Take one out, and uh, you're asked to pray, and most churches, uh, when you're ready, so you pray individually for, uh, uh, to thank Jesus, and uh, as I was saying, and then you take the bread. And then, typically, when the cup is passed, and you take the cup, and then a lot of churches say, well, let's do this together to remember the unity. Mm -hmm. And so you take the cup, you do that, together. So this is, this is exactly because of the context of the passage. So unity. But we sometimes overlook that. Uh, other churches, uh, you tear off, of, uh, you, come, you get a line and you come up to the front. And the pastor has a cup. So, so emphasizing that part, there's a cup of grape juice. And you tear off a piece of bread from someone who says, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Mm -hmm. And then you come to the front and or you, then you come to the, the cup. And you, you the, the person, the pastor says, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. And you dip it in, and you, it dribbles all over your pants sometimes, but you, uh, you dip it in, and then you, you take it. Well, that's more individual, right? So that's, uh, so that, but that's a, it's an efficient way to do this. Uh, but the way it happens at some, the way, something I appreciate about, about the church I attend is that we get in lines and we go up as a family. And we stand around a table with others. So there's a there's a uh, there's, there's a the cups are in the tray, and the stale crackers are. I, I shouldn't criticize. I shouldn't be condescending, <laughs> but they are kind of stale anyway. So uh, they're on a plate, and uh, and then so as a family we take, and we we uh, uh, and I have five kids, so it's, it's, it, that helps for unity. Uh, but we. Uh, we take the, the cracker and, and I pray as the head head of the family, and then we, we uh, and then we take that together, and then we take the cup, and we I pray as the head of the family uh, to thank Jesus for the, for the privilege of participating, and then we uh, we take that. But the issue is, is that truly, uh, you know, is that is that is that professing unity? And then what about a single person? What about someone who's a single? Are they who do they pray with? Who do they? How are they part of the, the unity? So uh, about six months ago, our pastor changed it to say, you can't go up as a family. I mean, not he didn't make it like a law, but, but he encouraged families to separate. So around the table, which is, has about six or eight people can stand around the table, and there's actually one of the pastors or elders of the church who is in charge of each table. And so everybody, uh, everybody takes the cracker, and the, the, uh, the uh, Elder or pastor will, will pray, and everybody will take together, and then um, oh, I think we'd serve. Yeah, we serve one another. So you serve the person next to you, and say, "This is the body of Christ broken for you." So that's serve. We serve one another, and then we do the same thing with the cup, and we take that together. But the, what our pastor says when we're done doing that, come off to the side and get to know one another, and exchange, uh, just read, you know, find out the name if you don't know the person. And so that's a big change culturally, but I think it's more biblical because that's because there are other factions and churches, sure. Mm -hmm. and so a chance to be together around the, the Lord's table, mm -hmm. I think, is living out the scripture, which, which again, the, the church of Corinth had a huge amount of division and faction. Mm -hmm. And so if you take communion together as a as a family of God, then uh, 
that is truly what Jesus wants, isn't it? We remember him, but what did, what did he preach? What did he teach? The unity of the body of Christ. So we don't always think about taking communion together as a way to, uh, to, to heal divisions or factions in the church, but perhaps that's a, a takeaway from today as we move forward to, if we see that, uh, if there's someone, if there are factions, or even in a family, Christian families have divisions sometimes, what if we take communion together mm. and remember Jesus? Uh, then I think that will be uh, perhaps uh, a, a great takeaway from this from this passage. Communion is not an individual action; it's a corporate action, and it's meant. To, when we look at the context, we just focus on the action. When we look at the context, uh, we can see clearly from Scripture that Paul meant it as a way to unify the church, and. Uh, Jesus meant as a way to remember, obviously, but there's a deeper purpose. As there isn't many things in Scripture, and then basically we can read the same passage for years, and then when we look at the context, we see, wow, you know, that's really deep. And, uh, and, and then also, I want to make sure, I'm not saying to, get, to drink wine, especially if you're, if you're under 21. So please, please uh, don't, tell, don't go tell your parents, Pastor Andy says, it's okay to drink wine with low alcohol. That's not, not the point. <laughs> the point is that, that uh, when you're of age and you can make, you know, and you know this, the context of wine, it's not, it's, uh, it's not forbidden for Christians to drink wine. Christians all the world do. Uh, but it's clearly that there's a danger of, being, of drinking too much. And so I choose to not drink any alcohol. Uh, partly, be, and, and partly because I'm worried that I, I wouldn't be able to, to I would, uh, that alcohol is scientifically proven to impact your judgment and all that. And the other reason is, and I, I didn't have a chance to do this, maybe next time to discuss this, but scripture please say, says it's by, if by what you do you lead others astray, then that's not good. So if I were to say, oh yes, I have the freedom to drink wine, and then one of my... Uh, my uh, friends uh, sees me, you know, sees me drinking wine, and he said, "Oh, if, if Pastor Andy can drink wine, then I can drink wine." And they lose control, then that's clearly not a good thing either. So that's that's another restriction that we, we need to take into account is the impact that that would have on others. So I choose to not drink any alcohol uh, for those reasons, even though I know I have the freedom to do that, but. Uh, and also, I think the alcoholic content is a, is a lot higher, as I said. So that's another danger. So, so I, I do not think it's a good idea, even though Jesus did drink wine and did that miracle. Uh, I, I don't think it's a good idea, but, uh, but we do. Uh, there are a number of brothers and sisters in Christ who will drink small amounts of alcohol perfectly fine. And those that use wine for communion, it, it's also, I would say, that's not... Uh, they're not heretical or anything like that. So, okay. so oh, you said 11:30, right? Okay. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you teach us from Scripture, from your Word, and we just thank you that you, Lord Jesus, uh, left us with this amazing sacrament of Holy Communion, where we can uh, take bread and drink grape juice or wine and remember you and your great sacrifice for us. And this morning we do want to remember that, how much you loved us, how your sacrifice, your perfect sacrifice on the cross paid the penalty for our sins. And we just thank you that we have the opportunity to remember uh, once a month what that means. And that we want to remember every day, not just once a month, how much you love us and by your sacrifice. And we pray also uh, that we'll be able to remember uh, the importance of gathering in unity around your table, around the Lord's uh, table, that that purpose can be accomplished through uh, Holy Communion. So we just thank you for that purpose as well. Just pray for each of our relationships, our families, this church, that there will be unity in the body of Christ uh, through the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.